Hey, this is Andy. And Randy. And we're here on AT Corner. Being an athletic trainer comes with ups and downs, and we're here to showcase it all. Join us as we share our world in sports medicine. Welcome back to another episode of AT Corner. We are bringing back another episode of the BOC in real life for the story episode. And this week we are talking about EAPs. That was a lot of letters. EAP, BOC, IRL. That is a lot of letters. <laughs> There's a lot of abbreviations just right in there. Mm -hmm. You know, I got so used to using EAP that I started working a job and they, their EAP was Employee Assistance Program. Oh, I've heard that, yeah. And I was like, what? That's not the EAP that a I know. Anytime, yeah, I was say, anytime I think of, I hear that, I'm like, oh, that's not right. No. <laughs> that's not what that means. That's not an EAP. <laughs> So the way we structure this is um, we're still trying to figure out these BOC IRL episodes, but um, we put in some nuggets of knowledge is what I like to call them <laughs> uh, for the BOC specifically. So if you're studying for the BOC, that's for you. If you're not studying for the BOC, stick around because we still have lots of stories um, from lots of different um, yeah. aspects of an EAP. So do you have any actually to kick us off? I have one. Uh, I mean, yes, kind of. Um, I mean, nothing really sticks out like specifically about EAPs. I just remember, man, like as a student, like it was ingrained into us that whatever new site we were at, the first thing you had to do is I need to know the EAP. And it was we were like quizzed on the EAP. That's good. Like it was drilled into us. Okay, what gate are they coming in? Okay, you're covering baseball today. What's the EAP? I feel like it has to be like that because otherwise it's so foreign for people to want to, you know, think about what their emergency plan is. Yeah. Or even even they're like, oh, yeah, we'll call 911. It's fine. But they don't realize like how often EMS, you know, EMS goes to new places all the time. Yeah. It's not like they're coming to your campus every single day and that they know exactly where to meet you. Yeah. I hope they're not there. Well, every okay, day. but here's the thing is even that that was gonna be the story to kick yeah. off for me is we had um a spine board situation where we had EMS called out to a high school. Oh yeah. And they got stuck behind a locked gate. The classic and annoyance right there. Not just stuck behind a locked gate. They were stuck there for like 20 minutes. Yes, I remember that. And on top of that, the ATs, the host ATs were like, we just called EMS yesterday and they took a different route. That's so annoying. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's wild. I don't. I don't think it was. It must have not been the same crew. Probably not. But that's the no, thing. Let's like, try something just, different today. Right. Right. So our first BOC nugget of knowledge is that uh, you must have a separate EAP for each venue, for each sport field, each court, gymna uh, gymnasiums, ATRs, which puts my personal EAP count to, I think, 13. Where, where you're at now? Uh-huh. Nice. We have 22 sports and 13 EAPs. How many do you have? We would have, well, uh, it's kind of, okay, so it's kind of like, how do you define it? Because the gym hasn't, we have an EAP for the gym, but it's slightly different depending if you're going to the volleyball court or the basketball court. Well, those are two different venues because we have. But it's housed in the same gym. I know, but no, it's not. It's the same I see, Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. It's yeah, a different so venue. there'd be two. Let's see, then football, the pool, soccer, weight room. Probably have about six. And your ATRs. And our ATRs, so eight. Yeah. Say about How eight. How do you only have eight? We don't have a lot of different venues. Really? Yeah. We oh, have... wait, uh, baseball, softball. So ten. Ten. Wait, eleven. Beach. <laughs> Beach volleyball. Just keep, just keep. You're gonna think of one in the middle of the episode. Probably. Right? Okay, eleven. <laughs> it would be eleven then. Okay, I don't know what we have that you don't have, because we have a north gym and a south gym. And we have room. one gym, but volleyball and basketball are different. And we have beach. We have tennis. Oh, tennis. Oh. Twelve. 
See? <laughs> Wait, is, what about badminton? It's part of basketball's gym. Okay. So it's wrapped into that one. Okay. He'll probably think of more. Probably. So There'll probably be another one. <laughs> Give it time. Um, Our first story is a gem from Jen. And that's the best place to start when we're talking about nuggets of knowledge right, right there. Right, right. So Jen, uh, Jen says, I have two indoor facilities, a uh, soccer field, softball field, football stadium, and soccer plays home games there, and we host track nationals there. Baseball field, which is off campus, and the bowling alley. Ooh, interesting. Yes, the bowling alley. We used to have hockey, so that was an additional EAP. Mostly the concern for the bowling alley was whether or not they had an AED. And at the <laughs> beginning, they didn't. The other concern was, in all seriousness, the oil on the lanes. If someone fell in that direction or got their thumb stuck in a ball and went down the lane and had to get picked up. I honestly didn't know that there were actual patterns of oil that they lay down, and it's a strategic decision as to how they want the lanes oiled. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Luckily, it was mostly the EMTs issue, but I was included. Uh, Oh, but it was included. So far, we've been all good. And then I also asked her about her off-campus spot because I think she said baseball's off-campus. Oh, okay. Um, she said, it's a unique situation and there's a, uh, there's a firehouse literally across the street one way and there used to be an urgent care on the other side of the street the other <laughs> way. Now that the urgent care is closed, we have to send our athletes elsewhere for stitches. Firehouse remains an option because it's ambulance equipped, but the first option is still 911. Nice. Could you imagine making an EAP for a bowling alley? I know. That's pretty crazy. It's funny that we brought up, like, in this nugget of knowledge, uh, the uh, having venue specific because obviously, like, venue specific is like really easy when it's like on campus facilities because right. you control all that. But when you're, I don't know, at a place that has no facilities <laughs> and you mm. have you use private uh, companies or public uh, facilities, you have very unique. EAPs for each one. I've been down that road before. So did you work with the company, like the private company, or did they already have an EAP? So again, many different interpretations of that. (laughs) So the public uh, facilities, like a park or something, were usually pretty good. And like, you know, they kind of had a set system. So it was a little bit easier for us to kind of implement that. And then if we were using a facility like from another school, right, they already had theirs. So we just right. like, OK, right. we'll take that. Uh, the the one that got me that like, I guess it's not common. I guess it, like it feels common sense to us because as athletic trainers, we're constantly thinking about EAPs. Right. But one of our have them for every venue, everything. Um, There was a basketball gym that we were going to start using and it was going to be new so we're like oh we don't have an eap yet we need to make this hey we need to talk to this guy and like like the this company and like hey do you guys have an eap and they were like uh, n- no should we have one i'm like man i feel like you should just have one anyways cuz you're doing like basketball things you know what it's kind of crazy what um people are okay with yeah um because even like one of my students works at a fitness place uh-huh. and they didn't have an AED for a while, just for like general population. Yeah. Like they work fitness with general yeah. population. And then finally they got one and it's unopened in the box. Oh, man. And it's like under stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's not ideal. Right. Sketch. Right. Um. Okay. So actually that kind of goes into the next one because Haley, um, Haley L, she's my first preceptor. She's, uh, she said... At the high school, I had about 10 different EAPs based on our venues and fields. It's a great assignment for interns and students, so they have to critically think about one, exit strategy and necessary tools, two, communication, three, how to make a 911 phone call, which that's something you have to learn. 100%. Um, And four, how to talk or control parents and coaches. When we made it to basketball semifinals and finals, we were at huge venues. Honda Center in Anaheim and Golden Circle in Sacramento that were posted in the visitor AT and locker room. Uh, Traveling makes you consider EAPs a little differently. It was fun to learn the EAPs and see the maps for those. Yeah, for sure. Which I don't... I'm trying to think about when I traveled what we did about the EAP. I think I've only traveled to schools. Yes. I mean, one time when I went actually with Haley to... Uh, Hawaii with football 
we did have some like parks but i feel like it was more of a like in your head yeah eap not like a written down yeah which um i actually asked about per diem work yeah when you that's true. are working per diem mm-hmm. what do you do about the ap yeah so 42 percent of people said they have an eap in their head 14 percent of people said on paper or on their phone and then we had 22 that said sometimes and 22 that said never interesting so when i was working um i worked per diem a lot um when i was working per diem I would always, and I was alone a lot of the time, so I would figure out who I had available to me. Like one of my basketball coaches was, who was like more consistent, right? Um, One of my basketball coaches was like a former paramedic. Okay. Um, So next door, like there was a pool next to the basketball Mm -hmm. gym. So I'd walk over every day and say like, are you guys going to be open the entire time? Yeah. Because they had an AED in there. And then we also had an AED in like, a locked office but i didn't have keys to that office so like you just have to kind of figure out oh yeah for sure what is your fastest mm-hmm. way because that's a time crunch so another boc nugget of knowledge did you know that failure to have an eap can be considered negligence yes that's true so all so all the people who make an eap in their head which guilty i've done that before that won't hold up yeah, well, I mean, obviously. Oh, well, and it also goes back to like just how unexplored per diem is and just how wild it it's is. It's so, it's such it's the wild a West. liability. It is, yeah. No wonder the liability insurance like twice the it, price for per diem <laughs> than it is for working full time. Yeah, for sure. Um. So, anyway, going back to the number of EAPs, um, actually, most people had between five and 10. Okay. But I don't know what range of settings I was in between. Yeah. I, I mean, it was every it was anyone who answered the poll. So <laughs> probably like anywhere from high schools to D1s yeah. to, you know, people who have like one EAP to people who have like 20 mm-hmm. EAPs. For sure. Okay. So now getting to the good stuff, the main bulk of an EAP. All right. Here we go. So I also consulted like different sources for like what... um. What the BOC uses, which yeah. I didn't know this. Um, did you know that if you go on the BOC website, you can look up what the BOC uses for their test questions? And there's like a multi-page document with like so many books on it. You know what? Yes, I do remember that. Like so yeah. many books. I do remember that. I kind of thought it was going to be like Prentice. No. And maybe the position statements. No. And there's a lot more. No, it's like a never ending list. Yeah. Yeah, There's a lot of options (laughs) to choose from. Which also, like, I mean, I feel you guys who's ever studying, like, there's some differing knowledge. Yes. Because I was consulting, like, Casa's sudden death book, and then I was consulting, uh like, Prentice, and I was consulting our position statement, and kind of like looking at, like, some different things. And, I learned that there are five parts of an EAP. I can't find that anywhere. I, and so I just kind of put these parts together of like some different sources that have been that are like on the BOC and just kind of like a generic. I know everyone has to have personnel, right? Yeah. Determine who's on the field and who will respond. Um, we know there's got to be something about communication. There's got to be emergency equipment. There's got to be transportation uh venue directions some things didn't say a map some things did which i thought was interesting yeah i mean the map's nice because then you can visually see well that's what i'm saying but it wasn't like a must-have yeah i mean as long as you have the directions i mean theoretically that you can't really share a map over a phone call yeah um but it it helps for the people on the ground right because then they know oh hey i gotta go that way right oh they're probably coming that way i should meet them there Um, so anyway, for the personnel, which is the kind of like the first part of an EAP, who's going to be on the field, who will respond. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was writing our EAPs, I kind of ran into like the, am I writing this? Cause it's, it's going to be posted, right? It should be posted. Should be posted. Yeah. Um, 
I'm kind of writing this as like the, am I going to post it for my staff or like when people rent out the facility, are they going to use this? Yeah. Because that is important too. Yes. Yeah. So you kind of have to like figure out what yeah. your goal is. So because like I'm not going to be on campus like 100% of the time. Yeah. Even though the athletes think you are. Absolutely. You you don't live there? No. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Um, In the book it says like this could be like ATs, AT students, physicians, EMTs, like et cetera. Um, when I asked about if people have students to help out with their EAPs, mm-hmm. I'm not kidding you, down to the vote. Wow. 50-50. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Is there going to be a runoff? Um, no, because it expired in a day. Oh, well done. <laughs> that's interesting. Yes. That, that's the first time we've had a 50-50, right? We've had 50-50 before, but I don't think it was down to the vote. Ah, like literally down to the exact person. That's interesting. Who clicked if they had students or not. Hmm. They made it completely even. Some people have said they also use their coaches, but you also have to know who your coaches are. Like same thing with me. Like now, there does, are some coaches I would not trust. But are the, is that using coaches like as crowd control? I've had a coach call 911 before. Or like that. Or the coach making, like telling the coach to make the call. I've never had a coach help with like log roll or anything. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I'm wondering. Like when they say like some people had p- coaches help, like what, what are we defining as help? Well, we have a story. Okay. You want to read it? Yes. This one's by Francesca P. In our district, we are contracted through a PT company. It was summer conditioning in July, the week before the start of fall sports. And my company had our annual meetings slash boot camp scheduled that week because we were told it would be a dead week. See, this is the problem. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. Lo and behold, it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. My team was one of the only ones still working out that week. I was not on campus because I was at my meetings. And about 15 to 20 minutes before the meeting was supposed to start, I get a call from one of my football coaches stating we need the AED to the practice field. I quickly reminded them that I was not on campus and they were going to have to send someone inside to the athletic training room to get it. From then on, what I know from debriefing with my coaches and administration is that the EAP was executed flawlessly. Two athletes ran to get the AED as soon as they saw coach start compressions. That's hey, that's good on the athletes. I know. That's pretty good. I know. EMS response was the quickest it's ever been. And after three shocks of the AED, he was resuscitated. Wow, that's crazy. Three shocks. Isn't that nuts? Like every that's part of that story. That's a lot of, of cycles story, of CPR. Every part of that story. Just Man. crazy. But that's all. See, the importance of the EAP. And this is why it's so frustrating when coaches are like, no, you know, it's okay. Like, we're just going to go this day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, But this is also why it's good to practice your EAPs in front of the athletes. Mm -hmm. So they know. Um, I had had an athlete who literally didn't understand what. I mean, I literally treated him all year and he thought all I did was just bring heat packs. He, That's it. He didn't understand that like there was more to athletic training. Yeah. And I was like, it's because they don't they don't see that emergency part until it happens. I'm like, did you not see me run out on the field all this season? Yeah. What'd you expect me to do? Bring a heat pack? Yes. Oh, here we go. Just, <laughs> just take this hot pack real quick. Right. Yeah, because I mean, they know what's going on. Yeah. So next part's communication. And this is has to do with like phones being readily accessible. And I thought what's interesting about this one is when uh, like in the position statement and in um, like the book and like some other like resources, it was talking about like a landline. Yeah. Or like an emergency line and some other things. So I was really hoping we would get a story about a landline and we did. Okay. So Justin N. You don't hear the landline very often. I know. I know. I was so excited. Justin N. said, we use a landline. Reception is horrible in our basketball gym. It is so enclosed. For a place with bad reception already and in a place with huge crowds, it's challenging to find reception when everyone's phones are all fighting over the same cell tower slash Wi-Fi. It's something that a lot of people don't consider. 
Having an emergency landline is huge if you don't have EMS on yeah, site. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right. That's something that I've been thinking about lately, too, because my phone, <laughs> um, I dropped yeah. it in a puddle on accident mm-hmm. and left it there. What because happened? Because I didn't know that it <laughs> fell out of my pocket. <laughs> um, and so it has some good water damage right now. And... Um, So different things like Siri doesn't work anymore and like, you know, like (laughs) other fun things like there's uh, some different fun colors on my screen. Yeah, you've had you have added colors that just stay there now. Right. And there are times that my I don't know how this affects it. I'm obviously not a tech person, but there will be times that I will be in the parking lot at work yeah and i will leave the parking lot and i will head down the street for miles and i will still not have cell service that's terrible right that's but terrible. but your phone hasn't your phone been right next to mine when mine doesn't have cell service and yours yes. does yes yeah so we what's need a back on with, what's going on with your tech who knows you know what maybe i'm the drama yeah. for <laughs> all the all the um am i the drama all the tech issues we've had with the podcast last <laughs> season at the end of last season maybe i'm the drama do you guys have any like landlines or anything like you know those emergency blue phones we don't have well we do have those emergency poles do they go to campus safety yes campus police campus police we actually have officers on hmm. on campus um yes those poles do go to campus police and then obviously we have our landlines in our offices, which it is. Oh, ni- I did not think about those. Which it is nice for me being being the indoor guy. Literally, my volleyball and basketball court are literally just down the hall from my office. Okay, but don't you have to like press certain numbers to call out? Yeah, but we our EAP runs through campus police. But I mean, even to call them? No, it would just be an extension. You just do an extension to call yep. them? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Ideally, they want us using radios, so really it's just switching to a channel and then calling. So I did ask this on our Instagram. 90% of people use their cell phones. Yeah. 2% use landlines or emergency phones. 8% use a direct dispatch through campus police. Nice. And pretty much, I think it was like less than 1% use radios. Interesting. Yeah. So actually, um, the only reason I included the direct to dispatch through campus police is because that's what I used to do at my old school. Because we also had campus police. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, they had radios. They would be at our football games. Mm-hmm. Campus police would have radios that literally connected to 911. Nice. That was down the street. Nice. So then I, like, luckily didn't ever need to use it. But. Um, I could just walk over to them and be like, hey, can you We need call? We need to roll. Yeah. We need to roll EMS. Yeah, I always wonder, because we have, we have those emergency blue phones too. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to talk to campus safety and figure out, like if we, if like our cell phones didn't work for whatever reason, if that would. Suffice. Right. It's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah. That would be good to know. Do you have different phone numbers on your EAP? Uh, to I believe it's to like like the hospitals that would they would most likely be transported to. Have you ever called the hospital? No. I always wonder why they have the phone numbers there. Well, I mean, I have the phone numbers on ours too, but theoretically, you could call the hospital, letting them know what's coming. So I've, I've, I I've think I've done that one time. For what? Letting them know of a possible overdose. Oh, I do not know this story. Not on like opioids, but like on just over-the-counter NSAIDs. Wow, I don't know I, this story. I had an athlete wisdom teeth surgery. Oh my goodness. And I think she ran out of her normal painkillers. And she just started taking a ton of ibuprofen. And then she started like her blood pressure and stuff were all over the place. She wasn't feeling good. And I was just like, you need to get looked at. Wow. 
So I had someone take them, uh, take, take the athlete to the ER. And yeah, I believe I talked to them, letting them know, hey, here's my findings. Here's what I'm concerned about. Huh. Yeah. Do you think they did anything with that info? I think so. Because it's a generic line. So they have to like reroute it. Yeah, I We're think so. We're talking about this in our... In our uh, I think they did. Especially when you start talking about overdoses. We're taking a health informatics class. We're yes. talking about this. About how EHRs and and other medical records mm-hmm. kind of like... Yeah. Reroute things and... Yeah, I love EHRs. <laughs> I love data. I'm a big data guy. Um. So, anyway. Uh... What phone numbers do you include in your EAP? I include. Oh, I have to go down the list. Oh, um, and us. Yeah. Yeah. Like us. Staff. Actually, you know what? I don't think I have us on it. I think it's just our office. It's not like my cell. Actually, that's why. Because we don't answer our office phone. So don't call me on the office phone. Why aren't you answering? Actually, I just got why, an office why, phone. That's I awesome. I literally just that's got That's awesome. It. Why aren't you answering your office phone? Um, Because we're never in the office. I'm, I always answer my phone. You're sitting at your desk? If I'm not covering a game. I'm going to call your office now. Fine. I'll recognize the number this time. Will you? I didn't last time, so <laughs> I will this time. <laughs> Do you remember the area code? Mm-hmm. Um, no, but I will. Yeah, I you see? It. Yeah, you won't know. No, I'll know. So I include... So anyway, I was thinking like in an emergency, I don't want people to waste time and call our office. Yeah. If it's a coach calling, they have all of our cell yes. phones in their phone. Yeah. And if it's going to be posted on the wall, I don't want a random person to call my cell phone mm-hmm. because that's also going to waste time because I'm not going to be on campus. Yeah. If if you don't already have my cell phone number. Well, that, okay, that just and brings we, up. And we also do make, a, I'm going to interrupt you real quick because we do make a point to like if someone's covering something that's like not normal, yeah. we do make a point to f- make sure that they know who to call. Yeah. It's funny about the cell phone number thing because I'll have athletes who like I don't just like like I I'm okay with the athletes having my phone number, but I'm just not like, oh, yeah, yeah, just text me. Right. Like, right. If they get my number, that's fine. I don't care if they need it. That's fine. But then a lot of them will be like, well, like they'll just try to randomly call me. Okay, (laughs) And you know what? Who's worse about the men's basketball? Men's basketball. No, Randy, I think that's a you problem because I've never had that happen. Men's basketball. I've only had that happen once. Men's basketball is the worst at this. They try to FaceTime me. I don't know why they do this, but I tell them like, guys, just stop. I'm not going to answer. They're like, well, if it's an emergency, don't call me. Like, call nine call nine one. Call nine one one. <laughs> okay, so we got off track, but for real, what numbers do you include in your AP? I think uh, coaches. No, I put um, uh, I put the poison control number. Oh, smart. That's a good idea. I put our mental health. Yeah. 988. I put, um, oh, our non emergency police. Okay. And nice. That's a good idea. Campus safety emergency line and campus safety non emergency line. Okay. Hmm. Previously, I've put like AD and Dean, but. Again, I didn't put them on this new one. Yeah. Um. So Nicolette said she puts the docs, AT staff, coaches, campus safety, AD, dean, ortho surgeon, dentist, and mental health. Wow. Which dentist is a great yeah. idea. Yeah. And uh, speaking of dentists, MVP Nicolette and us we have the same team dentist. Oh, really? Yeah. That happened by mistake. It like I reached out to the guy and he was like, Oh yeah, I do some stuff for this school too. I'm like, Oh, all right. I know. Seriously. Didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's cool. So in this section I also put a little script for nine one one and I put a script for campus safety because we always tell the students like, Okay, you gotta call <laughs> you gotta call campus safety but they're probably gonna be like, Okay, what now? And like yeah. I don't wanna Yeah like have to deal with them and the athlete I'm caring for, right? So I make sure to go over it. Also, like when you call 911, the biggest thing that I've had that people like get snubbed over is the age of the patient. Yeah. 
And I always tell them, okay, like, you don't have to know their exact birthday. You don't need to know. Yeah. Like, did they turn, like, 21 yet? Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're if it's an athlete, they're probably college age. If it's someone in the stands, you could say middle-aged woman, mm-hmm. middle-aged man. Yeah. If it's a kid, like, tell them it's a kid. Yeah. Right? Like, just use your contact yeah. clues. Like, you don't need to know, like, exactly. We can figure that out. Yeah, for sure. And then another thing that I tell them is, like, here's a script of, like, it says, here's a here's a one line of what you need to start with. Yeah. And then you need to pause and figure out what they're going to say to you. Yeah. Don't just start rattling off things. They have a protocol that they have to go through. Yeah. And they have to answer all their questions. So then I have a list of things to be prepared with, like, age of the patient, um services being rendered yep. how long um where they're at like i have a list of everything um that they may need yep. and i'm like don't start saying these things yeah at like wait till they ask because if you if they ask you a question and you answer something else they'll ask you that question again until you answer it yes they can't move on yes so we always practice that go over that And then next section is emergency equipment. This is establishing specific procedures and policies regarding removal of protective equipment, which I don't have in my like post DAP. We have it in our policy. Yeah. But I don't have it in like our EAP EAP. Yeah. I mean, most places I've been at haven't, we haven't really had equipment intensive sports outside of baseball, softball. So. That never really came up. So, Nicolette also sent us an EAP for softball and baseball catcher's equipment. Oh, nice. Because, you know, we all learn football. Or at least you should know football. You should learn football. Oh, everybody. At least as students, everyone has learned football um, removal. Is that a requirement? I believe so. Um. Most people said they have one for football, one for softball, one for baseball, one for boys lacrosse, and then also the military. Ooh, that's interesting. Right. I know um, that's we, interesting. we talked about, I wasn't part of emergency for performing arts, um, but we talked about how we would remove the costumes. Ooh, that's true too. So I got to talk to Nicolette to see if I can share that. Oh, yeah. EAP. Uh, that'd be cool. That'd be cool to see. Because mm-hmm. that is a good point, like catcher's gear. And then also such a difference between baseball and softball. Because most times softball, it's the full hockey mask deal. Right, right. Whereas baseball, sometimes they do the hockey mask. Sometimes they just do the traditional old school catcher's mask. Right. You should probably also know refs or at least the umpires. Um, which... At least, uh, especially home. Um, Again, it goes back to sometimes it's the old school mask. Sometimes it's the hockey mask. They also have the chest, the chest protector. Plate. Yeah. I don't. I can't think of any other officials that or refs that would wear equipment, equipment. other than hockey. Yeah, they just have a helmet. Yeah, I can't think of any either. If you guys think of any, let us know. Um, okay, transportation. So this is like emergency care available around you. Urgent care is which locations are the highest trauma center. So like which resources are available at each hospital. Yeah. So like trauma one is like 24-hour staff specialists, whereas like some places only have like a, I don't know the numbers, like a, like not trauma one yeah. <laughs> would be like, they have those specialists available on call, but they're not there yeah. right then. Like I know for our school, we know which one is the trauma one because we've had to send a kid before I got the yeah. before I started working there. Um, we had to send a kid to a trauma one, so you know it's good to know. I mean, EMS will know that. Yeah, they know where but, they're, but you need to know where they're going so you can exactly. direct people to get there. Exactly. And then uh, next section is activation of EMS. So this is actually calling 911, calling campus safety, opening appropriate doors, designating individual flag down EMS, and direct them to the scene, doing the scene in crowd control. Yep. 
um, having venue directions, having a map. Well, I was going to say, and speaking of like where they're going is I'll, I'll try to ask the crew too before they go. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll try to ask them, Hey, where, like, where are you going? Like, where, you know, where's this rig going to go? And usually, usually they're pretty good about letting, letting you know. Um, you want to read the next gem from Jen? Yes. So Jen says, I have an EAP story where it all went wrong. I was in grad school, so EAPs were just starting to be a thing, and cell phones were also just starting to be a thing. But we all had landlines, and some places didn't have 911 yet. That's crazy. <laughs> That's wild. You called the local fire, police, or ambulance, depending on what you needed. So I was not working, but I went to watch the men play basketball at the school I was working. Yes, I just couldn't stay away. Well, there was a collision, and the whole crowd saw an opposing player dislocate their ankle. <laughs> Holy smokes. Obviously, I went down to help. So the kid's ankle is almost 90 degrees from where it should be, rotated laterally, shoe on, in immense pain. Luckily, the ATR wasn't far, so we got him in, and I started to examine him while the other AT activated EMS. It was only my second full year as an AT and the first time I'd ever seen this kind of injury. I checked his pedal pulse, found he had one, and basically monitored him, for sh monitored him for shock and left his shoe alone because, for all I knew, it could be the only thing holding his foot together. So we're waiting on the ambulance and waiting and waiting. This school was sort of out in the country, but not 30 minutes away from help. Turns out, there was construction on campus, and the road to the gym was blocked off. Yes, they started that literally during the game, because it was after four, and no one was on campus. Oh my gosh. That's so unlucky. <laughs> it took the ambulance almost 40 minutes to get there. We had to call back twice to figure out what was going on. They kept saying, we can't get there. The road is closed. It was a huge mess. The EMTs finally got there. The athlete was taken to the hospital and had surgery. He was a visiting player, so there wasn't any good follow-up. Since I wasn't called to testify in a malpractice or negligence case, I assume everything turned out okay. I couldn't imagine being the athlete waiting for 40 so minutes in with, pain. With, uh, what was it, a dislocated ankle? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no I couldn't thanks. imagine that. Your pain receptors can only, your endorphins can only I was, last you so long. Well, I was going to say, I mean, at a certain point, I'm sure they, his body just hit that mode of just natural opioids and just. Yeah. After a while, man. What is that? Level three pain? Theory? Yeah, that is level three pain modulation. That's a, um, that's a BOC term for you. That is. <laughs> and I show my students how to induce it all the time. <laughs> it's very valuable. It has served me well in some, uh. Um, extreme cases. So this reminded me of two stories. I don't know if by the end of telling the first story, if I'm going to remember the second story. But the first story is one time this construction thing happened to me while I was, I was working at the high school and okay. I was finishing up treatments and then I got in my car and then was ready to go. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, the one exit to the par from the parking lot was complete, like a trench, <laughs> and and it was blocked off by yeah. workers. And I was like, "What is going on?" Yeah. Apparently, they decided to work on the the like ramp area of uh -huh. the parking lot. Yeah. From the parking lot to the street. Yeah. While people were in school, because they said school didn't get out. Yeah. So no one would have to leave school. Yeah. So I was stuck in the parking lot and I just sat and I watched. I don't remember I that. watched them work on. I think you were at work. Probably. This was like midday. Yeah. And I was just like sitting and I just watched <laughs> the construction workers just work on the on the <laughs> asphalt. Okay. Yeah. That was very kind of them. And what was the other thing? Oh, I remember. Okay. Okay, so the other thing is that um, construction on campus is one of the biggest reasons why you have to change your EAP. Yes. Like, for example, we had an EAP that had 
an entrance that was a parking lot, and now that parking lot is a huge building. I can't go right through that. No, <laughs> you cannot. And it also affects like where locker rooms are yes. or where certain pathways are closed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you have to think about that when you have construction. You can't just be like, oh, it's fine. Actually, during COVID, we had to redo a lot of our EAPs because they were taking advantage of no one being on, on campus. campus so they're like, oh, let's this is our chance. Construction. <laughs> Except that athletics was on campus. Yeah. Everyone forgets that athletics just doesn't stop and they just <laughs> and keep going. You're right. Like athletics has normal hours. Right. Pan- There's a hurricane in California. It's fine. Pandemic. Bam. Denic. Yeah, Demic. Oh, that was good. Thanks. <laughs> um. So another thing that they were talking about that doesn't have to be on your EAP, but specifically for EAPs yeah. is just that they should be well practiced. Yes. True. And um, this is just like not just the equipment removal, not just, you know, who's going to be out there, but also who's involved. Yep. So like we've done it where we have our campus safety, mm-hmm. like come do a practice day. We have our EMS come do a practice day. We've had um, the coaches like get involved, the athletes get involved. And so that way, like people kind of know what's going on yeah. or they at least see us practicing. Yeah. Um. Sometimes it depends on the, what the sport is, but like, like in general, we'll do like a big day that we have a bunch of mm-hmm. our emergency scenarios. And then like for me working football practice, we'll do like weekly, like the night before a game while we're waiting for people to ice bath. Like yeah. we'll do um, equipment removal or like log rolling or stuff like that. Log roll Friday, huh? Thursday. Log roll Thursday. Because it's our last contact practice. Mm. Thing. Nice. That's cool. You want to read this next one from Anonymous? Yes. Anonymous says, I work rowing, and a part of our EAP includes practicing how to pull unconscious athletes out of the water. Our EAP also includes six different addresses along the river, and we practice how EMS would get to the river for each one so we can choose the closest one in the event of an emergency, rather than having to go miles back down the river for the boathouse. See, these are things you don't Yeah, I would not have thought of that. Yeah. That's interesting. That's a good call. Mm -hmm. We do hands-on practice yearly with our EAP review. All of my coaches practice with me. We have multiple coaches, and they sometimes take boats in multiple different directions during practice. So there is an emergency with one boat. There is a chance they would need to perform the full task on their own until I can get there. So we all practice being able to do it both on our own and with various combinations of coaches and coaches plus AT. So this reminds me of when I used to work with stunt performers or um, like like the special rigging that has yeah. to be done for stunts. Um, for those specifically, they have to have people. So like, you know how in the pool, like you have lifeguards. Yeah. Like for stunts, you have, um, man, I don't remember what they're called, but uh, like basically like rigging specialists that's what i'm gonna call them right now um i really don't remember what they're called but um they have like different levels Uh and they can like each level can only be like a certain amount of feet off the floor and as they get higher off the floor to do the rigging for different things which by the way like two hours of rigging gets like a four minute show oh my god or like less than that yeah like it's a lot yeah um but as they get like higher in ranking like if some like let's say someone was like stuck up in the ri- in the like the uh-huh. the wires and everything up yeah. there like I as an athletic trainer can't go up there yeah you know so they actually have people on site who do the rigging and do the checks that they are trained okay for rescue oh that's cool and then they ha- they go like higher up and so like the higher up you go like you have different levels that you uh-huh. like have to pass and then you are able to rescue that level and below or like something like that okay it was pretty cool to learn nice that's awesome but another thing like you wouldn't think about yeah or like 
um it was a long time ago i think it was when we first started the podcast we did um on our story we did we posted a reel or i guess before reels we posted a random video yeah that someone posted um about a pole vault accident that someone had like fallen Uh weirdly like on their head or neck or something on the mat Mm -hmm. and so then we talked about like what's your eap for like getting someone off of a squishy mat like without moving it you move very slowly yes so then we had a bunch of people like weigh in and talk about like oh you Mm -hmm. know you could put like boards down or you could like do this or you could army crawl or move very slowly and so i mean those are things that you just like just have to figure out before (laughs) before an actual emergency yes yeah for sure so emergency equipment can also be taken like two ways. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, the emergency equipment, obviously, that they were talking about removing is going to be like your actual sport specific stuff. But um, the actual equipment that you have should be on the EAP too. And this is, um, I asked like what equipment people have mm-hmm. and it ranged a lot. Some people, I'm just going to like, I wrote down like all of the, I think I wrote down like all the ones that I saw. AEDs, C collar, splints, BVM, suction, OPAs, NPAs, emergency oxygen, Narcan, EpiPens, blood pressure cuff, pull socks, stethoscope. Um, you know what? Also emergency glucose. Oh yeah. Or glucagon. Uh, glu- uh, or and a uh, glucometer. Yeah, glucometer. I um I feel like we're missing one. Well, we're probably missing a bunch, but there was like one more that I was just mm, rectal thermometer. Oh yeah, rectal thermometry. Yeah. So there's a lot. We put it in a big bag. We call it the jetpack. <laughs> uh, the epipens. We actually have our students and inhalers. Uh, we have our student athletes that if they have allergies and have been prescribed an epipen or have asthma and have like are actively using an inhaler uh to bring us an extra one and we put it in their travel kits oh that's smart so then like when they're on the road and like oh i forgot it or it's way over in the locker room that there will always be one in their medical kit in their travel yeah, kit. because the, because the best place for it is in their car which yeah a lot of them think that's where it does the most good yes at one cross country race i did have an athlete who was having an asthma attack and decided to run wheezing to her car. And I was like, no, 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 no. We're going to take control of this. Give your keys to this person. We're going to send that person to your car. Oh, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) There was definitely a panic. So another thing that we talk about on the EAPs are the emergency signals. Oh, okay. Um, so Megan M said, anyone working elite or international rugby has to take the world rugby course. So every medic on the pitch uses the same system. Oh, that's cool. Which by the way, uh, my employer, we, uh, we lent out some supplies to USA rugby for their, for one of their course days. Really? Yeah. That was pretty cool. That's when I first learned about it that like, oh, they all do that. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Wait, you knew about this? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know about it. Within like the last year, I found this out. Well, I found out within like the last day. You're you're welcome. (laughs) Thanks, Megan. Um, So anyway, she said, it cuts down on problems with language barriers. Also, rugby has specific game rules for blood time and head injury assessment or HIA at those levels as well. They allow a temporary sub to allow assessment and suturing. Normally, once a player is subbed, that's it for them. So this allows an exception to those substitution rules. So it also alerts the referees. So she said that uh, some of them are like hands crossing an X. That's blood time. Okay. Hands to the head is a head injury or an HIA, head injury assessment. assessment. Um, both hands up is all hands. So everyone out, like C-spine, cardiac, emergency situations. That was actually something I did at uh, my last school. I was like, okay, if I do this like heart, like hand over my heart, yeah. like everyone needs to come out here because I need the AED. I need someone yeah. 
to be ready to grab emergency equipment. I need yep. someone to help me remove equipment. I need someone. So it was like this is all hands on deck. Yeah. Um, pulling both hands up like a stretcher at your sides oh. is stretcher slash extraction. Nice. So those, she said those are main ones. Nice. That's cool. That's a cool system. I'm, that, that makes sense. My main ones are roll EMS, like a tornado finger. Is that what this is? That's what I was like. Um, your finger like in a spiral. Yeah. Uh, finger. Helicopter finger. Helicopter. Uh, no, what is that? A Siren. Siren. Wee you, wee you. Yeah. Uh, what's the, the, um, why am I blanking on the wet bulb globe thermometer that you use? A sling psychrometer? Yes. Like this. A psychrometer. A sling psychrometer. Have you ever had to use one? I didn't in real life, but I did as a student. I'm never going to forget using one as a student. <laughs> For our comp, I literally had to go to a random field that was allegedly, in the scenario, our practice field, sit there for a minute, letting this thing swing around. People are just walking by, probably like, because it's just- It's a, a new toy. It's a cool It's just toy. a regular, like, it's a, literally just an IM field at, on a college campus, so people are just walking by like, what the hell's wrong with this kid? In the middle of the field, just- <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> Um, what's some other ones? Oh, the hands crossing the necks. For me, that means splints. Okay. What is, what? what <laughs> my, what's, what's yours? My favorite was, it would be, uh, uh, basically fist knocking. That was for the vacuum splints. Because, I like mine better. Because it makes the vacuum. Uh-huh. Because that's what the vacuum does. So we'd go like this for vacuum splints. Yeah. You throw your hands up in an X and it means broken boat. <laughs> I didn't say there was anything wrong with it. I'm just saying that's not what the I look do. Look, you gave me. It's not as cool as this. Uh huh. Clapping fist. So, uh, what else? Hand on your chest or like pounding your heart. That's AED. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, driving a cart, or like Juan likes to say, like a low rider. So we we did that, right? The like steering wheel thing for getting the cart, but then. Like when I was a student where we did the hand signals at, we also had an electric cart. So the question came up, how am I going to know which cart? So we had to make up two different signals. No, you're not putting gas so, in it. So we had, well, because the gas powered cart was this one. And then the electric cart was plug this. Why? We would do That takes plug. too much time. <laughs> too much time. You're, you're, not, putting, you're, ha- you're not putting you're gas having, in the... You're having students come up with these, okay? You know. Okay, what else? What else do you need a signal for? I think those are all mine. Doc. I actually didn't have one for Doc until like last week. For, I feel like this is an old school one, but I remember where, again, where we were at for the hand signals, it was just a fist. So actually our next story, Chris C., he said, uh, EMS to field, no matter the issue, is a fist in the air. And a physician to the field is tapping your head. Oh. Which I'm now adding to my. That's repertoire. a good idea. Thank you, Chrissy. Sub. Tapping your head. Sub. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Asking for a sub. It's like I need. Uh, I'm hurt. Get me out. <laughs> Get me out of this situation. <laughs> I need. I need to call a friend. Yeah, phone a friend right here, please. Please. Yeah. I need a. T- I need the top of the medical food chain, please. <laughs> yes, there you go. Get out here. <laughs> um. So I need this to not be all my liability. <laughs> Um, Chrissy said, when we have our MTO, which totally went over my head, that's medical timeout. I've never seen it abbreviated like that. Neither have I. That's kind of cool. MTO, EAP, BOC, IRL, MTO. We're coming at you with the abbreviation stuff. <laughs> yeah, coming at you here. <laughs> um, MTO, medical timeout. They're notified of that. Also, in our county, I've gotten pretty close to all the schools using fist and air, so that's pretty uniform across the board and easier for, e- for EMS as I communicate with the EMS coordinator for the entire county which is seven schools plus we cover three other schools nice um no seven schools we cover plus three other schools it worked wonders last year a host at didn't have a medical timeout nor a distinctive way of signaling for ems so i found them once they arrived and told them my signal i had a c-spine injury in a game and before the host at could even get his ad on the field with the fist in the air the ems came onto the field nice 
so then I asked about like the medical timeout and you said, um, I do both before the season. I get with EMS coordinator to make sure they have all the EAPs for the high schools in the county, whether it's like the stadium or the practice field or a field that like rarely it's used. Mm -hmm. Um, If there's an EAP and it's sent to me, then I send them to the EMS coordinator. Nice. I also discuss what protocols for our company are, such as the fact that we don't remove all the equipment on site for C-spine unless deemed medically necessary and that the universal sign will be a fist in the air. Nice. He also does an on-site medical timeout um, for Friday night varsity football. It's the medical team for both teams. I also invite the AD for both schools, the SROs for both schools, ask the officials to send someone, and then if EMS is on-site when we conduct it, I include them. If not, I'll make an effort or have a physician or a manager go speak to them once they arrive on the scene if kickoff has already occurred. Nice. Um, and I was like, how do you have time to do this with like so many people? And he was like, well, I usually try to do it about 20 minutes before kickoff as both teams finish warm ups and head back to the locker room. I invite so many people, but it usually ends up just being medical personnel. Hence why I go into depth in the letter that I send out, nice. which he did send to us. So I got to talk to him about if he's okay with us sharing that. Nice. Um, I also communicate with my game admin and SRO about hand signal and code word over radio. Nice. Very covered. Yeah, really. That's in depth. I like it. Mm-hmm. I have never had to signal EMS to come to the field. We'd usually just give them a radio. Knock on wood. No, I mean like with mm. a signal. Yeah. I've had to get them to come to the yeah. field, but it's we usually give them a radio. Now we can't because we don't have enough. But yeah, actually, we don't even have EMS on site. That's something we stopped doing. Hmm. We do. We have EMS on site. Just food for thought. Do you guys have a BLS? Uh, You know, I'm not sure it rolls out. We had a BLS rig and anytime that we called, anytime that we needed them, they would have to call for backup. They'd have to call 911. Yeah. Yeah. So then we were paying $500 to $1,000 a game for a different entity to call 911. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. So, and and we have a very good, very close EMS. Yeah, that so makes a big difference. for us, it didn't make sense. That was the nice For thing. other people, like if you're very far from EMS, it's probably a good idea to have EMS on site. Yeah, that was the nice thing when, for where I was a grad assistant. Um, literally, the fire station was right across the street. So anytime we activated, they were right there. That is nice. Legit, if you were at the baseball field, you would actually hear them after you called. Oh, wow. Yeah, you'd hear them. You'd hear the truck come out of the garage. Wow. (laughs) And we had the nice thing, too, is 911 automatically dispatched to campus police. So if you were on campus and you dialed 911, it went straight to campus police. Why is that nice? Because then it didn't have to go to Sacramento. Oh, I see. To get paired back here. It I literally see. would be an on campus response. Oh, cool. Do you have any other EAP stories? We've shared a lot over, I know. The, over the course, not just this episode. I mean, in general, like you and, yeah. you and my EAP episode, or, uh, stories. Yeah, no. no so we do have a Facebook group where you oh, can share. I do have. Speaking of just like using personnel and having all like um, like off campus, we had uh, like we would host a cross country meet at a county park. And so we would have to run things through the rangers. So anytime oh, we needed, right. we I had to contact the park rangers ahead of time, you know, to get the plan and who am I talking to and who's going to be there that day. They would give us a radio. And yeah, if we had to roll EMS, we would basically go through the park rangers Mm -hmm. so another consideration right just more people you have to go through yep so we do have a facebook group where you can share your eaps or you can see the other eaps that hopefully some other people will share so that's facebook.com slash group slash at corner podcast future story episodes we're looking at um also actually i posted a bunch in our facebook group it's pinned to the top I believe our next episode is about cranial nerves. 
So if you have a story about diminished cranial nerves or how you remember the cranial nerves or anything, honestly, I haven't figured out what we're... That one might not be safe for work if you're asking people how they remember cranial nerves. There's some uh, <laughs> there's some graphic mnemonics. There are. There are <laughs> some. Um, times you felt burnt out and how you've managed it. Ooh, we've done, we've done that one before, but I think that's a good one. To that's bring a good back. one. It's always nice to acknowledge also like with a different audience i feel like as yeah. we are growing we're getting more people who probably haven't shared their stories so that's true. uh stories about blood and wound care favorite cu or course you've ever taken favorite at Ooh. gear or product you've gotten Ooh. I'm, those are just a few of my ideas so no particular order right now all pretty dope um we'll also post on our instagram in our story is probably like a tuesday or wednesday morning of the week um yep of the week after a story episode because then it'll be getting ready for the next story episode um and then every other episode if you guys are new we do every other episode as education or stories this one was a story episode which means next week we are going back to our education episode where we're doing another cu yes that's the plan and remember that it's reporting year we are getting very close to the end of the year i know it's like fall season and fall season is so heavy for so many of you so don't wait you can also use code at corner for 150 dollars off medbridge which is good for this year and next year since you get a full year subscription or i mean this reporting cycle and next reporting cycle and i think we are done with the fine print because it's getting a little long that's true you got anything else nope that's perfect thank you for helping us showcase athletic training behind the tape bye